My name is Ellie Brooks. I'm a, a board member and director of the Holocaust Centre, um, president of the Friends of the Holocaust Centre, and um, secretary. But um, my job at the moment is to introduce you to um, a wonderful, wonderful, one of the wonderful Rwandan survivors, Frida Umahosa. Um, Frida was born in Rwanda in 1980. Uh, where she lived with her parents and her five siblings. Uh, she and her family were victims of the 94 Rwandan genocide alongside 15 of her family members. Um, um, miraculously, um, she was uh, rescued by a young man who worked for her family. She's the only survivor of her family and now married to Rob who's here and they have seven children, which is, I find absolutely amazing because if you do the maths, you can work out that she's very young. <laughs> um, Frida graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Communications. She speaks internationally and locally, telling her story of miraculous survival. In country, she's been speaking in countries, um, England, Scotland, Germany, uh, United States where she's lived for some time, France, and now newly living in Melbourne, so we're very fortunate. She's the author of Frida, Chosen to Die, Destined to Live, and her other book, In the School of Resilience, um, which Frida's actually brought a few copies along, so I'm sure she'll sign it if you're interested in um, purchasing them later on. But I give a very warm welcome now to Frida, and um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and um, I just really want to say thank you to um, Holocaust Museum to have thought of uh, having um, the commemoration for the genocide that took um, a million of our people. And um, I'm so honored to have been chosen to be the one to give um, and uh, tell you my story tonight. Um, I want to focus on two things tonight. Um, as much as I want to talk about the genocide denial that is going on, which we all know that, um, just like uh, Mr. Michael Rose just said, a genocide is a very long process. And so the last stage of all the eight stages of the genocide is a denial. And that is just to re-victimize the survivors. And that's where we are right now, where the people deny the genocide against the Tutsi, calling it a Rwandan genocide or calling it a double genocide. Uh, as much as I would like to focus on that, um, I'm not going to do that tonight, but I would like to focus on the unseen or invisible wounds of survivors today, 25 years on. Um, the invisible wounds that survivors live with or walk around with. Because if you met me in Melbourne today, you wouldn't know that I survived the genocide. Unless you talk to me, you would not know who I am and where I've been or what I've been through. I'll give you my story. Um, I'm not going to be able to finish it because it would take two days probably. <laughs> um, but um, like... Uh, um, Ellie told you, I grew up in Nyanza, um, which is a small town in Rwanda, and my family, extended family, all lived there. I had three brothers and two sisters, but unfortunately my youngest sister had been killed in 1993, a um, few months before the genocide started, as a baby, and she was killed um, as a nine-month baby in the hospital. Um, as you've heard, the genocide had already been prepared and was already, um, people were being prepared and getting ready to kill. So between 1990 and 93, a lot of people were being killed. If you were a Tutsi and you, were, you, know, you went into a hospital um, for just a small thing, sometimes you didn't come back. If you traveled from one town to another, you didn't come home. In fact, my father, who was a businessman, was also accused of um, um, supporting the RPF, which was the army that was trying to rebuild the country, and he was put in jail uh, in 1990. But um, going back to when I grew up, I wasn't told by my parents that I was a Tutsi. I discovered that I was a Tutsi in school. Because when you started school as a little kid, 
you would find either from your friends that you were a tutti, or you would find from the principal himself. So in my school, the first time I went to school as a six-year-old little girl, I found out from the principal who came in the class, in my class, and counted how many Hutus and how many Tutsis were in the class. And my best friend happened to know what she was. And like I said, my parents had never told me that I was a, a Tutsi, and I knew that we had a lot of friends we, who were Hutus, we lived in a neighborhood, even though my extended family was, lived close by, but we also had a lot of Hutu um, neighbors and friends. And in fact, I remember my dad coming home uh, on the weekend from work, and he would help people. People would come to our home to ask for help, financial help. And so I really was never told that it was a, a problem play with Hutu children or any other child. When I discovered that I was a Tutsi, of course, I was made fun of. I was called a snake and a cockroach. And that is when I discovered as a six-year-old that I was a wrong tribe. That day I went back home and I asked my mom, why did you choose to be Tutsis? It's such a wrong tribe to be. Now, as some of you know, the culture of the Rwandans, they don't talk too much about anything really to the children. So my mother told me, we never chose it. We were born that way and you better be proud for it, but that's what you have. I grew up knowing that you know, I was a wrong tribe, I was a snake, you are in a wrong place, wrong country, but then 1990 when my father, like I said, when my father was put in jail, then I discovered much more about what was coming. 1994, um, when the Hutu president, Habyanimana, was assassinated, we then heard over the radio that it was time to kill. We had known that, like I said, my sister had been killed, so we had known that in the neighborhood, um, machetes and clubs had been supplied, and so they were getting ready to kill us. But to be honest, it's so hard as a child, I was 14 at the time, so hard even for an adult to imagine that your next door neighbor, your friend, and your coworker will come to your house to kill your family. We left home, not knowing whether we would ever come back. My home was demolished. And a few weeks later, after we'd been running around and sleeping and hiding into bushes, then a few weeks later, the announcement was made that it was OK, that we could come back home. It was a lie, because they had already killed a lot of Tutsis in my neighborhood. They had a lot, killed a lot of people in the country. It was a lie, now it was in May, it was a lie so that people could come back to their homes and they could have them easily. So my grandmother who was still alive and my sister and my, um, my two aunties who were being hidden by a neighbor were then told to go home. We had, we had no home to go back to, but we decided to go to my grandpa my grandfather's house. My grandfather was a teacher and he was a very respected man, a godly man in the community. So they had left him to die of hunger and thirsty. So when we got to his house, he was still alive sitting there reading the only book he had, which was a Bible. The house was, full, uh, was partly demolished, but he, my father, my grandfather was on the part that wasn't demolished. The next day, my mom arrived as well, who was still alive with the three boys, my brothers. And um, she had two boys of her best friend that she was helping. And so she turned up with five boys, and then the following day, my dad also came. So it was a wonderful reunion to see, but of course, my father, who was the only man that they were really, really looking for in that community, being accused that he was supporting the RPF. Now, he could not stay in the open with us, so he was hiding on the roof of, the, of my grandpa's house. We were there for a few days, and then they decided to, to come and pick all the people that were in the community. They picked all of us up and took us to a roadblock. Now, a roadblock was, in every 10 meters in the country, there was a roadblock. A person could just wake up and put a roadblock right in front of their home to kill. It would be a center where they would rape women, kill children, and slaughter cows and eat and drink all day, raping women and killing people. We were taken to that center. When we got there, 
as many as we were because we were more than 100 people, mostly women and children. My grandpa was the only man who was leading us. Nothing to help us but a Bible in his hand. We were then told that we were too, they were too tired to kill, so we were asked to buy a grenade for ourselves. Now, in my neighborhood, in my, in my village, to be shot, you had to pay because a bullet costs money. And remember, you're a snake and you're a cockroach. You're less than a human being. Therefore, you cost nothing. For if you want to buy a better death, you better pay for it. We had nothing. We had been gone for days without even food. We had nothing completely. Everything was taken away. So we were too poor to pay for a grenade on that day. And when they realized we had no money, which they already knew anyways, they said, go back. We don't have time for you. We'll come back. We went back, on the th which was on the 3rd of May, the fifth, uh, on, the sixth, on the evening of the 6th of May. They had a meeting because their president, the Hutu president, was to be buried on the 7th of May. And they said that on the day that they buried their president is the very day that they had to finish the job, which was us. The job was us, killing us. So one of the guys that was on the soccer team that my father had studied and sponsored in the neighborhood came and told us, we just had a meeting and tomorrow will be your last day. My grandfather said to us, nobody leaves because it's going on everywhere and we've been running for months. We need to stay together and die together. We stayed in my grandpa's house, broken house, praying all night, knowing that in the morning you are too poor to pay for a bullet. You are too poor to pay for a better death. And your father, as much hard work he's done, he's not going to be able to afford a bullet for you as a child. We were 18 people in that house all night, scared, hungry, and too weak to cry and too scared to speak, but you couldn't even leave. We stayed in the house. In the morning at 3 a.m., we heard the neighbor's children screaming and crying and women screaming, people running out, and they were killing and we knew the next turn was ours. We stayed in that room, still praying, and then the young man came in, in the room, and he opened the door. He had blood on his clothes and on, mach on his machete. A young man that we knew very well, that was on the same soccer team that my father coached. And I think he had still had humanity in him, and he got out and told the group, they're not here, they've left. But the leader of the group said, Tutsis never run. They die like sheep. They must be somewhere here. So he came in and he saw all of us. And as kids we were scared and we covered our faces and he mocked and laughed. He said, you mean you didn't see all these cockroaches and snakes? He said, I didn't see them, this young man said. He said, well, if you want to be forgiven, you have to kill 10 of them. They got us out. We were all hiding behind grandpa who couldn't save us. Grandpa tried to talk to them, but they wouldn't let us go. They said the RPF was not too far, off, too far away from where we were. And indeed, we could hear the bullets not too far off. They were in uh, um, Ruhango, which is the next town, but they couldn't get to us right away. And so my grandpa said to them, I've been a teacher. I taught you as my own children. Why doing this to us? And they said to us, they didn't want to waste their time. We should be able to hurry up because they have a lot of work to do on that day. We were led to a, a, a ditch right behind the house where my father was hiding. And in my heart, as a 14-year-old, I'm thinking, please, Dad, just get down and run. But he was too weak to run. We went in that ditch. We were told to lay down in the ditch. And you were asked to choose what you, could, you wanted to be killed with. They had clubs, machetes, spears, and knives. You had to choose one of those, but no bullet. And I chose a young man called John who had a club. I knew with a club they would beat you at the back of your head a few times and you'd be gone, and I thought it would be better. And as we went down in that ditch, muddy ditch, because it had been raining, and my grandpa again tried to beg 
that the one guy jumped in the pit and hit him with a club. And as he fell forward, they all jumped in that ditch and started killing and killing. My mother's head that was chopped off, that's what made me so scared, and I covered my head with a hoodie that I had. And at that moment, this guy hit me at the back of my head, and I was unconscious. I don't know how long I was unconscious for, but when I woke up, everybody had died, and my sister was still breathing, but they were already burying. And I thought into my heart, if I ever scream and show them that I'm alive, they're going to pull me aside and kill me in a wrong way. So I decided to keep quiet, and they buried. And I'm thinking, oh, it's easy. Maybe after they leave, I can shake myself off and come out. I stayed in, and they buried and left. They buried talking like nothing has happened, talking about how they kill and how this person took too long to die and how that person takes too long to die. And they buried and went away. Staying in that ditch with 15 dead bodies, my mother, my four siblings, my four aunties, my cousins, and my grandparents. I just prayed in that grave. And I said, Lord, if you ever take me out of this grave, I'll serve you all the days of my life, and I'll be a nun. That is the place I know how to pray. I had no idea anybody would ever hear my voice, but a woman who was picking bananas in that plantation heard my voice and she ran of terror because she thought it was a ghost and she went and told a young man who was working for my grandpa and he said it must be someone buried alive so he came hours and hours later he came and dug me out and I left my entire family in that grave and walked away now I was wounded and I couldn't walk but he tried to help me and put me somewhere where he could go and ask someone to help me. And this woman helped me for a few hours and then she decided to let me go because she didn't want to die with her family. The following day, I was then picked by someone else who hit me until the genocide was over. Now, like I said, the scars of a survivor, whether you see them or whether you don't see them, they are there. For some of us, a sin, you can see them on the outside. I wanted to show you a picture of some of my friends. This is a friend of mine. Five years ago, I created a group, and I called it Sisters. For some of you who've watched a, a film called Ghosts of Rwanda, it's a documentary, Ghosts of Rwanda. This girl is in that, in that documentary, and her name is Valentin. Valentin survived in the Nyarubuye church. She lives in Texas today. She's lost her fingers. She has a lot of cuts, a lot of cuts on her body. But I'm telling you that the scars that she has on the inside are way, way, way worse than the ones that she has physically. This is my friend Shiki. She survived in, the, um, in Kichukiro, at the school where the UN abandoned people. She was only five years old, and she lost her arm. She lost her arm, and she lost her mother that was killed with her. But she was able to walk away with her two brothers, and she survived. But she, if she tells you her story, the scars that she has on the inside are way, way worse than the arm that she lost. This guy has no scars. His name is... Jean Dodier, he doesn't have any physical scars, but he's lost his entire family, and he's lost his extended family. Talk about wiped out families. This is a guy who has no relative. We are the relatives that he has as survivors. We are his family. This is Console, my friend, the author of the uh, Tested to the Limit. Console was raped and cut on her, she's never, She's never wore a skirt without tights because she is ashamed of what her legs look like. But most importantly, the scars that she has on the inside and the living with HIV AIDS because when she was raped as 14 year old, she then was infected with HIV AIDS. She lives in New York. When you see her having fun and dancing and laughing, you will never know that she has to live with the trauma of being 
HIV positive because of the rape that she's experienced. Now, when you look at us, we don't really show those scars on the outside. 25 years, a lot has happened. A lot has been done in the country, like you just heard. Um, a lot has, done and has been done. We have grown. I was 14, today I'm 39. Just recently I was thinking about my mother. My mother was 39 years old when she was killed. When I think of that, I always saw her as an old woman. So that means maybe I'm old too. But when I look at my children, and they are the same age as I was when the genocide happened, that's when I see that it's really been a long time. But when I talk about it, it sounds like it was yesterday. There isn't a day that goes by without me thinking about my fellow survivors and without thinking about my family. This is my seven children that you've heard talked about. My husband and uh, his mother also lives with us. So our household is a, probably the biggest household in, in Australia, maybe. Um, but this is my hope. This is my family. When I tell them my story, I want them. And indeed, it is a blended family, white and black. But when I tell my children, I am able to tell my children, I'm able to tell them my story, but bringing in hope, bringing in those scars that reflect the strength, that re reflect the courage, that reflect the, the sense of love that I want to pass on to my children, not the hate, not the division, not the hatred, not the bitterness, but being a better person, being a better woman. Every day I wake up, if you look at me today, you wouldn't know that just since last year, I started having nightmares again. But when I have those nightmares, what is my strength? My strength is prayer. My strength is remembering that I cannot give up. One, no matter how much I face, no matter how much I feel the pain of having those nightmares, I am not giving up. And I am standing because I know that the God who, served my, who saved my life on that day is still able to save me even today. But as I tell you the, that story of survival and telling you about my fellow survivors who suffer in those, um, like especially when we have commemoration like this, all that stuff that surfaces and all that trauma that they live with, our responsibility as people, not just as survivors, is to come alongside that community of survivors and help them and understand them and give them the ear to listen to them, to give them that gift of listening to them and come alongside them. I've been, this year, been on my heart, pressed so much on survivors that have no family left whatsoever. Especially, I have a friend that I've been advocating for and her name is Maria. Maria was raped and cut on and thrown into the ditch and her backbone was broken. She's been in bed for 25 years. She's not able to stand or sit or get out of bed. How much trauma do you think that person lives with? And how much help do you think that person needs? So as I give my story at this commemoration, as we remember and commemorate our loved ones that were lost during that 100 days, those 100 days of horror and those 100 days of terror, those 100 days of pain, I also want to tell you that you have 100 days to think about the survivors that have to live on each day without trauma. Will you do something? We talk about the world that watched during those 100 days and did nothing. But as us, as you, will you join hands with someone, with an organization that is helping the survivors and do something to make a difference? And we all can. We are all capable of being a voice to those who are voiceless. We are all capable of doing something. 
Don't be a bystander. God bless you and thank you.